Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. And it's great to be joined this evening by a fellow Twitter historian, since we met on Twitter, uh, Dr. Angela Riotto. And uh, it's great to have you on, Angela. Thank you, John. I'm super excited to be here since I usually watch it and listen to it on my podcast app. And now to actually be on it, I can see all the magic and all the fancy technology that goes into it. There's not much magic, but yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. I need to, I need to really kick out the podcast. I've been slacking. I need to get back on that. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, Angela earned her PhD from the University of Akron in 2018. Her research involves ways Union and Confederate former POWs discuss their captivity. Uh, currently, Angela is the historian with the Army University Press Films team, developing accurate documentaries through which to teach U.S. Army doctrine. I remember hearing a lot about that when I was an archivist for the Corps of Engineers. Uh, recent publication is Defending Our Suffering, Union and Confederate Ex-Prisoners of War and their post-war public, uh, publications. And the war went on, reconsidering the lives of Civil War veterans, edit, edited by Brian Matthew Jordan and Evan Rothera with the LSU Press. Did I miss anything? No, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I just saw someone pop on from Lewisburg. So actually, I'm from Pottsville, Pennsylvania, originally. So Oh, really? Beer. Yeah. So Mechanicsburg. So guys, yeah. I'm from that neck of the woods. Actually, how I became a Civil War story and I got interested in it was because my dad would drag us to Gettysburg um, or Antietam. I know John was there today to do yeah. history buff vacations. Oh, yeah. And they would always be like, oh, like for my younger brother, like jump in front of the cannon, take a picture. And my brother would be like, no, I don't want to. And I'd be like. <laughs> so. So you were hooked. I, I was it. hooked since I was we on Civil War history, and I have never gone back. So I usually I usually ask that from people when when was the spark? When what was the thing that just started this journey? You know, that's that's good to know because I was like eight when mine started. So I think we had a fun picture a couple. I'm going to say months ago now. Time is so relative. Being in self quarantine, right? <laughs> and working from right. home. But I found a picture of me probably when I'm about 10, being very stylish, storming away from one of the monuments at Gettysburg. <laughs> um, I think it was the like a Mississippi monument. Okay. And I was like, wow, like I think this is probably when it started. It's like mm -hmm. being so fascinated with battlefields and preservation and the stories of the soldiers themselves. Mm -hmm. And then I just continued it throughout my, you know, education. Yeah. Now, that's awesome. And now you have a really killer position. I do. Um, I'm very, very fortunate to be working for the Army. So I got my PhD in May of 2018, and I was hired in July of 2018. Wow. <laughs> so I'm very fortunate to have a, a position. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I, I know what it's like to suffer through USA jobs, and usually the turnover isn't that quick. <laughs> no, but... Not like, so we're obviously going to be talking about Civil War history here and how it's so relative. But if anyone's interested and is interested in positions, the Air War College is actually hiring three new positions right now, um, wow. all faculty. And they're somewhat more for space, but they're even looking for people who are not space historians or cyber historians because they realize that historians just have the skills to critically think and be awesome in the classroom. So if anyone's looking for a job, Air War College currently is hiring, and they are fantastic positions. Wow! There you go. I know. I know a bunch of grad students watch and and uh, want those leads and networking and all that. It's that's key. So don't You're, be afraid of USA jobs. No. Yeah, I got scared off, and look what happened to me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm going to Western. That's what happened. Uh, Angela, though, why why did you want to go? The route of studying prisoners of war. What was the, what was the reasoning for that? So yeah, that's a great question. So I initially was interested in just veterans, so Civil War veterans, and I was at a panel at the Society for Military Historians. It was my final year of my master's, and it was a panel for veterans throughout American history, composed of faculty members of my master's program at University of Southern Mississippi. So it was Susanna Ural who was doing like Hood's Texans, Civil War veterans. 
-hmm. We had Kyle Zellner, who was doing like King Philip's War, New like New England Borderland War veterans, and then we were also had Andy Weist, who was doing Vietnam mm -hmm. veterans. So their experiences during the war, coming home after the war, their community identities, and I was like, wow, this is really fascinating. I would be interested in looking at Civil War veterans in a different way, specifically even looking at Pennsylvania, Schuylkill County, my home county veterans. Mm -hmm. And I started reading all of the scholarship, um, or at least trying to, there's so much, right? <laughs> and I realized that while going through these fantastic books by Jim Martin and Brian Jordan, that POWs were kind of either not mentioned, mm -hmm. briefly mentioned, or either absorbed into the major narrative of what a veteran was, or kind of even put out on the sidelines saying they're a very specific type of veteran. Mm -hmm. Their case is very extreme. David Blight has that section about how their experiences can't compare. Mm -hmm. um, and they're so traumatic. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's really fascinating. Like, they're kind of essentialized, like boiled down into either just like every other veteran or being very different. And so I wanted to dive into that a little bit more. And I realized that they are different. They recognize that they're different. And that's why they construct these narratives to explain why they're different and why they're still worthy and why that they can't just be lumped in with other veterans. Hmm. I've always wondered that about 19th century uh, soldiers who became prisoners of war. Uh, were they seen differently by the public? And I've always wondered that because of the fact that, uh, you know, post Vietnam, we all, we have the POW MIA flags, we have things like that, and and prisoner exchanges and and such. I've often wondered about how was that perceived in the 19th century as compared to the 20th century, if there were were any differences. Yes, uh, I there there definitely is a difference. So it comes, it depends on. Let's like where I want to go back from this. So it even starts during the war, right? That you see this propaganda um, where prisoners of war are kind of used as tools of this propaganda, especially in the North to kind of attack the Confederacy and attack um, Confederate cruelty, evil treatment of prisoners. Like we know, of course, the famous stories of Andersonville. Um, even before Andersonville was established and before stories came out of Andersonville, Libby prison in Richmond is really seen as the evidence of Confederate cruelty. Mm -hmm. So you have these prisoners who are being released, they're sickly, like even when the exchange was still going on, and they're saying how terrible the enemy is. Mm -hmm. And that is going to circulate throughout Northern newspapers. And I say tools there because um, certain groups of people do really use prisoner of wars and their stories um, for their own purposes. But prisoners of war are also part of this, which is part of my like larger argument that they are actively constructing a narrative. So even starting in 1862, you have released or escaped prisoners of war using themselves and their stories to illustrate a point about the enemy. Mm. You have the same thing with Confederate POWs who are escape, who are escape or re are released, that they're also sharing these stories. Some of them are more like adventure based. Um, which we can go on a little bit more later, like the exciting stories we read in these captivity narratives. But they recognize that they and their stories can influence policy and can influence the public's perception of the enemy and even um, possibly influence or even get back to the people who are still in the ranks, either to per like keep them to keep fighting, not get captured, not surrender, mm -hmm. or like to start the exchange back up. So they recognize that they're very powerful and they use that to their benefit. They recognize that they're not just any other veteran. Mm. I bought, that's something that I've always wondered because you hear about the prisoner exchanges until Grant ends it. And uh, I've often wondered how those men perceive themselves as far as a masculinity thing is concerned. You know, uh, do they see themselves as, uh, still having a sense of masculinity or, or are they um, kind of like harder on themselves because they were captured or, or, or what? And that, that was something that I always try to ponder from almost like a gender studies kind of thing. The, the, the idea of masculinity among POWs or ex POWs. 
No, you are exactly right. Manhood, um, perceptions of gender, perceptions of honor, duty, they all play a very significant role in how these men portray themselves and how other people see them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've had a chance to read Dave Silkenek's most recent book um, about the stigma of surrender. It's called Raising the White Flag. He gets into that a little bit about different perceptions of surrender versus capture, mm -hmm. and what that means. Um, I'd also discuss it in my own research, but they, there is a real concern that they are not worthy because they were captured, that they surrendered. And I think we can really spend a lot of time even discussing uh, capture versus surrender. Um, right. even in today's military, military, like that is the idea that you never surrender, right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, because a true man, a true soldier, um, someone who's truly loyal wouldn't surrender. Right. Um, even the idea of being captured after resisting as much as you could kind of threatens th their masculine identity. So a lot of these individuals will actually make up these fantastical stories about how they fell into enemy hands. Hmm. So something I like to kind of joke about is I, I looked at 380 Union Confederate POWs and all their, anything that they published between 1862 and 1930. So actually I see a change over time because several people published multiple times. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing how many of these soldiers claim that they were captured because their horses abandoned them. <laughs> really? Right? And you're thinking, <laughs> yeah, of course, because every infantryman <laughs> in, yeah. the, in one of the Union armies had a horse. Yeah. But it's always this, this story or um, some that they're, also come up is that they were surrendered. They didn't surrender, but their officer surrendered them and they have to obviously listen mm -hmm. to their commander. Mm -hmm. Or um, they only surrendered after like every hope was lost. Like they're out of all ammunition, they're out of water, they're wounded. Like they know that there's no other option. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another more sympathetic story that like helps prove that these men are still honorable is that they'll claim that they were captured um, while helping a buddy, right? That they, the one story that I have, um, it comes out, it's a Confederate POW. He was writing in the early 1880s and he says that he was actually trying to save his brother and his brother was wounded. And while trying to save his brother, that's when he was captured. So not only like pulls at your heartstrings. So not only does he have those familial ties that honor and duty to country, but also his unit and his brother, but that he's still a man and he's still worthy of remembrance because he did this mm -hmm. because they realize that there is it's there's it's right. There's they're afraid that there is no honor in becoming a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. There's still stigma attached to it. They have to deflect to Would live you, with them, to live with themselves and exactly. to live with their peers, which is not right. We know this is not, limit it to civil war POWs. Mm -hmm. We see this, Brian Feltman wrote about the stigma of surrender for World War I, um, and he's looking at the German army, right? We we know that this is not limited to civil war veterans, mm -hmm. um, but this, it still comes up today, like I said. So currently in the military code of conduct, it says that you will never surrender mm -hmm. as part of the current US military code of conduct, mm -hmm. right? You must be right. captured. And you can, you're like kind of pushing back on that. Like, well, once if, like once if you are wounded, once if every person in your unit is wounded, one if you're out of ammunition and water and food and the most honorable thing is to surrender so those people can get treatment, it's still argued that you should not surrender. Hmm. So what does that tell us about even our current societal judgment hmm. of capture versus surrender? Right. Yeah. And, and that's something that I think we get those we, too often we interchange those terms uh we don't separate those two terms it's it's um have you experienced that with with talks that you've given or or people who you've interacted with through this process of research where uh too often that we don't disseminate between those two terms even though to the military they mean two different things yes it does it does come up um it's actually interesting because people usually do use them interchangeably. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that kind of, I think, perpetuates the, the negative connotation mm -hmm. of becoming a prisoner of war is when people um, use them interchangeably. 
is that they didn't seem to be like they didn't fight back that maybe they're they're not as active they don't have a lot of agency mm -hmm. and it kind of assumes that there's something to be captured right so mm -hmm. in current i'm going to use u.s army doctrine because that's what i know right. um you capture an objective right mm -hmm. that objective is an inanimate object it could be a city it could be um, a building any sort of objective a bridge um and then but you can also capture a human being mm -hmm. right so it okay. kind of breaks them down into non-complex humans mm -hmm. and then surrender it gives that person more agency right that they are actively surrendering to someone like they're conscious in that action but then it also is it showing weakness mm -hmm. so something to analyze right right yeah that's that's amazing that's a psychological thing right where it's like yeah you are doing an act by surrendering but you're not doing an act by being captured it's, but it's, it's probably a, but it's better to be captured because right. it assumes that you're still fighting right yeah even, exactly. even now the term prisoner of war um and we use also epw which is enemy prisoner of war mm -hmm. is kind of you can I, like maybe troubling maybe not troubling is the right word um but at least I think worthy of thought is a prisoner. If you think about it is maybe someone who's done wrong, right? Uh -huh. Like we uh -huh. use the same word for people who are in prison, in jail for crimes and penitentiaries. I know you just talked to Andy Zombeck a few weeks right. ago. Right. Oh, hopefully her internet didn't go out. And she's looking like a penitentiary. Okay. Sorry. Are you it was like thinking for a little bit. Yeah, you're good. You're back. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. I was like, what's happening? <laughs> um, and even the term prisoner of war, yeah, it's 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 kind of challenging right now. Um, so somewhat they're moving forward to is you'll hear like detainee, because detainee does not say you've done anything wrong. You're just being detained for further questioning or for your safety. You know what I mean? Right. That's a word that we'll hear now that will be kind of switched out. Um, and of course, when we say EPWs, so when we're talking about the enemy prisoners of war, we use EPWs and the prisoner of war is left to friendly units. Mm. So there, there's even a designation now between those two terms. Wow. <laughs> Which like, I don't know, I don't have the, the, the justification for that, the reasoning behind it, I've never seen it. I've never actually looked. Um, but I remember when I first started doing research, I saw EPWs pop up in my research for Iraqi freedom. So that's mm -hmm. side note for my actual job. My movie focuses that I work on is Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003, which is completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw, I saw EPWs and I was like, what's this acronym mean? And they're like, enemy prisoners of war. I'm like, why not just say POWs? And they're like, well, they're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that even tells us something. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. And and I remember trying to get all those acronyms straight too. And that was fun in itself. I learned something um, every day. Yeah. But while we're on this, if we want to talk about another really cool acronym that I think is important to what I'm talking about and how it's still relevant mm -hmm. is if anyone knows what SEER training is or ECAC mm -hmm. training. Mm -hmm. So... SEER training is, um, I think, I know the Army does it. I don't know if some other branches do it, but it's, so survival, evade, resistance, escape. So it is a course taught to people who are going to be in combat zones or in highly volatile zones that might be captured. Mm -hmm. So if your plane is shot down, so pilots are a group who get it. So if your plane is shot down, which does actually happen, a helicopter um, crashes in the invasion of, like, the beginning of Iraq and March of 2003, two pilots are captured. So the idea that you, um, first of all, survive whatever event that happened, um, mm -hmm. and then you evade capture. So whether that's, you know, crawling in a canal, climbing a tree, getting in a house, whatever you have to do, um, try to evade as much as possible. Then if you are captured, because again, you don't surrender, you have to resist as much as possible. Right. Whether that's during capture, you also, the key to this is interrogation, which um, we don't see much interrogation as part of the camp system. It does happen occasionally. It usually happens immediately upon capture in the Civil War, mm -hmm. uh, or like when they're like when they get to Libby Prison. Major Turner is known for 
taking personal belongings from prisoners and asking them a few questions, but we don't see like the real threat of what we see currently mm -hmm. um, or what we saw in Vietnam mm -hmm. or World War II. Um, so not only do you resist questioning, so you give, you know, your, your possibly your name, your seal number, et cetera, and like basic information and then escape. Mm -hmm. And then ECAC is like the B level version of that, especially for the air force, which is evade and then conduct after capture. Mm, okay. So even then, like we, even within those notions, the idea that it's not surrendering, it's capture. And mm. the fact that one, that you are able to resist and that you're willing to ex resist and you're expected to resist. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's taught to our current service members. Right. And these range from like, I think a three week course for SEER. Um, and they actually like they do, they interrogate you and they beat you up in these classes. And then like ECAC is only like a four day course. It's much shorter. Hmm. I'll take the four day beating anytime over the yeah. other. Uh, <laughs> I breathe easy. I don't need to do that. Yeah, I was like, I don't like, no, like I'll, I'm not, yeah. I don't think I'd be good under pressure. Like <laughs> I, I get nervous, like just talking to you, John, like this is awesome, but I get nervous just like going for like a conference. Can you imagine if like <laughs> <laughs> someone came in to ask me something like, what do you want to know? I can, yeah. like, not that I know much, but like, I will tell you anything you need to know about Civil War PW is just for me. Yeah. I, well, don't be nervous coming on here. It's just me. Uh, you know, I, I, I try to keep a laid back thing here. So don't worry about that. Um, when you were going through this process of looking up these POWs and researching these POWs, what were, what were your means of research to do this? Did you go for letters, diaries, all of the above? So um, I went through mostly memoirs and published memoirs, um, published narratives after captivity. Okay. I'm interested in the construction of memory, the construction of narrative. Mm -hmm. So I do occasionally use diaries and letters to use as kind of comparison pieces. Mm -hmm. right? right. But mostly I'm looking at what they're publishing after they're released okay. uh, or after they escape. So I start in 1862 and I go up to 1930, like I said. Um, I chose 1862 because that's the very first appearance of one of these narratives of captivity that I'm seeing. So we have a few that are still part of the exchange system, mm -hmm. the Dix Hill cartel, and they're released. So they're in prison for a little bit of time. And then once they're released, once they're exchanged, they start publishing about their experiences. Mm -hmm. And then I go up to 1930 because that's when it largely drops off because you have um, these individuals actually passing away. Okay. okay. Um, I'm sure there's, I think, I think 1930 is definitely where I stopped. I think I saw a few that 1932, 1933, but I was actually kind of using a statistical sample and mm -hmm. I didn't want to skew the sample. Mm -hmm. um, so 1862, 1930. Mm -hmm. And some of them are published. So archive.org, um, if some of your audience members are familiar with that website. Archive.org is fantastic with a lot of digital books, especially ones that are no longer in print. They're on, available there for viewing, um, whether that's text form or you can download the PDF. Mm -hmm. So many of those are on there. And they're like, a lot of them are from actual archives that have used archive.org as a digital platform. Okay. And yeah. then others, I actually did this week is the like four year anniversary of me going on a six week tour around the South, going to small historical societies and archives and prisoner of war camps to collect more stories. Mm, wow. Um, because what you see is former Confederates don't have as much access to publishers um, in about the 1860s, 1870s, even into the the early 1880s, as much as former Union prisoners were. So a lot of them you'll see either publish for just family members and then donate to the local library, historical society, mm -hmm. or as part of like memorials that they've had in their like closer area. What I actually found was incredibly helpful was at UNC. So their the Southern History Collection, right. that is a treasure trove oh, of really? some of these stories. Yes, it's yeah. fantastic. Actually, I had a few that um, I've shared with other people because a few of them I just happened upon because they're not listed as part of a prisoner of war document. Mm. Um, I was just like pulling, you know, you get excited, you start pulling folders and it yeah. was like stuck in with an old estate file with like receipts. Oh, wow. And it's like one of, it's like one of the best stories that I have. It's actually some 
it's tight. So it's later, it's around the turn of the century where you have prisoners of war um, are sharing stories back and forth to each other and editing each other's work. Wow. So um, I actually shared, I don't know, um, Tim Williams, Dr. Tim Williams, he's in Oregon teaching. He just published a fantastic article in Journal of Southern History about the roots of the lost cause in political prisoners and prisoner of war's diaries and letters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he was, we were teching back and forth and he was like, oh, I have all the sources that I think I have from this collection. I'm like, hold up, like you need to see this. And it was, it was seriously hidden <laughs> in the state files. It's wow. fantastic. You would think, you know, we, um, people who have been students here, you have professors who use red pen to mark up your stuff. The one former prisoner was using red pen to mark up his comrade's stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. And it's as if like, yes, this is this happened, but not exactly how you remember it. Wow. Which if like you're looking for your smoking gun for how like prisoners were actively constructing and shaping the memory of what happened to them. There it is. Yeah. So wow. it, it was an ex exciting experience. It was very rewarding yeah. um, to do that. And I know not everyone is able to do that. So yeah, online is good for that too. That's amazing. But yeah, it's, and some of them you can still purchase. Um, I have a stack, actually, I'll show you. Um, I have like a stack of like original POW oh. memoirs. Yeah. Um, you can still find these sometimes at like flea markets and online. This yeah. one is from 1886, original oh. publication. Wow. So obviously those are very important to me, <laughs> but those are <laughs> online. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, in the age of digitization, so much more is getting online and yeah. so much more easily accessible. Um, I know that a few people have uh, asked some questions for you already. Oh, I uh, see them. Which is awesome, because I, I love getting people to interact with uh, speakers and such. Uh, Andrea Lee Pike asks, are there any records of USC TPOWs out there? Um, she says, I know they were either killed or sent back to the South, but were they ever POWs? I knew there were some in Andersonville, but uh, would you like to go into that experience if you've come across any records or of uh, 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 data that you found while on your journeys? Yeah, definitely. They, they do exist. Um, she, we know, um, John, you just mentioned, many of them are either killed upon capture, right? It was, um, I don't know, it's like official government, like Confederate policy right. uh, or a threat. Uh, many of them were re-enslaved or sent to do um, hard labor for mm. Confederate armies. Mm -hmm. Some were sent to prisoner of war camp, but also you see that as more part of to do labor, right? Uh, Christopher Barr, he's now at the Reconstruction mm -hmm. Monument down in South Carolina, but he knows more about the Andersonville prisoners. Um, they, I do not have any publications though from U.S. colored troops um, from after the war. You do see them mentioned sometimes. You see um, even in the Henry Wirtz trial transcript, mm -hmm. there's one or two that give their what would be the word? It's not. I was going to say tribunal, but that's a testimony. But yeah, a yeah. They mm -hmm. give their testimony about the abuses within the camp. Okay. Um, but yes, they're not. They're not as widespread and I don't have any of their actual publications, but they do exist. Okay. And they're usually used for hard labor. Mm. Are, are they not published like the white soldiers because the publishers don't want to talk about USC T troops or the, or is it, do you think more of like, they just don't have access to publishing uh, organizations uh, or is it just, I, I don't, I don't know why. Some of them weren't published after the war is what I'm saying. Was, was we, probably we, we've talked, yeah, we've talked about this. Uh, I was at a conference a few years ago as part of the Filson about prisoner of war throughout history. And this conversation came up and it's not something, I don't want to say we took it lightly, but we kind of said like, it's because they didn't make it right. Mm -hmm. um, many of them probably didn't survive their prisoner of war experience. Mm -hmm. Um, they do have a call out later in the 1880s and 1890s in the turn of the century for anyone who was a prisoner of war to um, come forward and publish their story, especially with Century Magazine. You would think that would maybe be a possibility. I haven't seen anything that says that we don't welcome mm -hmm. black stories. 
Okay. So I'm not really sure if that if is true. Like again, um, because it's something that Chris uh, Barr and I were talking about, Adam Dombey, about why don't we have these stories? Mm -hmm. The general assessment is that they they probably didn't survive the war, and if they did, they probably didn't survive long enough after the war. Mm -hmm. And that goes back kind of what to conversation I have with Pete Carmichael and Jim Downs about uh, post emancipation. Uh, movements of, of these uh, free African Americans moving and, and contracting disease or or being weakened by travel, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, from uh, uh, Downs is like sick from freedom. That yes. Book. Yes. Um, yes. Or even we have. Let me see. Let me look. Um, Hannah Rosen. She has terror in the heart of freedom. Mm. Freedom, right? Yeah. So, fantastic. Yeah. So even if they did survive, then the possibility that they did have an entrance um, or possibility to publish. Mm -hmm. um, we also understand that even the white <laughs> veterans, not are not many are literate. If they are, maybe they can read and like write their name. Right. Like, do basic. Um, so not many are they're not even like going to be writing and publishable. So I have 380 that I look at. There's 400,000 who are held in captivity. Right. Wow, so yeah. I just have a small yeah. sliver of even who have been published. Right. And I was, a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I yeah. was just telling someone the other day about how even the ones I have, a few that I saw actually at Andersonville, mm -hmm. that they're handwritten. Right. I have the handwritten memoirs that they wrote. Mm -hmm. That's redundant. Sorry. Um, and they are written phonetically because mm -hmm. they're they can't really write english properly right. so it's whatever they can pick up so oftentimes i had to speak out loud to translate what i was reading to see if it's even worth it to keep it for research or before mm -hmm. i took pictures or before i transcribed it because it was so non-standard english mm -hmm. and oftentimes not only are they writing phonetically but it's also with their accent <laughs> Right. So can you imagine how silly I look like in the back of the archive room in like Andersonville or in like Columbus, Ohio, like reading things out loud and like with this terrible accent. Um, <laughs> but so that's, yeah. you know, there's also that issue that we have that some people are unable to write, like actually don't have the skills to be able to write. Even I argue that some people, even if they're able to write, um, they're not as eloquent or they're not great storytellers. So you'll see that some POWs actually borrow stories from other people verbatim, right? Full on wow. plagiarization, plagiarism yeah. of yeah. other people's stories because they want to tell their story so badly. They think it's so important to be told to their family members or their community, but they don't have the words to express themselves, whether that's because it's a traumatic memory, whether that's because they don't have the skills, maybe they don't trust their self, like trust themselves. They don't actually think they're good enough that they will take a published book, mm -hmm. a published story that was widespread and cut huge sections out <laughs> and include it the exact in their work. Wow. <laughs> Which, like, if you can't like it's hard like sometimes you can say like well maybe they just wanted to make a like turn a dollar right that's why they're telling their story but you have to understand like again trauma traumatic memories you mm -hmm. know i talked to current oif veterans where they the some of the stories are so ingrained in their brain like they're seared because they're so traumatic but others the chronology's off um they can't keep people's names straight so they'll defer to someone who can mm -hmm. So they'll right. be like, I remember this one. I know these 15 minutes, like the back of my hand, I'll never forget it. Right. But Chris told me this, this, and this, and this, and this. And then mm -hmm. he trusts Chris's narrative because he can't trust his own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, we don't know the these wow. individual's intent. I can't go back in time and talk to them. Sure. But it just shows you that like even the narratives we do have that were preserved that I was able to find. And I'm like, even for the book, I'm doing more research. Um, that there's very few. And even those, like some of them tell the same stories over and over again, which <laughs> is, you know, tells us something anyway. Yeah. And I had someone I just saw over in the questions, not to jump off, but Gary, okay. um, Gary, the, you're okay. thinking of Camp Douglas. Gary Hauser talked about the one up in Chicago. Yes. Yes. This one. Yeah. That is Camp Douglas, which I have an awesome book about um, the archaeological digs. For Camp Douglas, oh, yeah. I trust it. That's cool. Yeah. 
Like That's, I just wanted to call that out because I just saw that pop up. I'm like, I know that answer. Yeah, uh, there's a there's a great question here from Mike Froning, who uh, is my buddy from CWI Summer Conference last year. Did you find regional differences with POWs, Eastern and Western troops, in terms with how they reacted to being imprisoned and memory? That's a great question. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it's definitely. Um, how they react to being captured, how they react to imprisonment. So you have a few individuals who um, will judge other members in prison. So some of the like the larger battles where people are captured, are like Chattanooga. Yeah, you know how many units are at Chatt Chattanooga? Like there's people from all over all over the South and the North. Um, so like at Andersonville, you have people split into groups not only based by uh, based on unit um but also by region and they'll judge other people so you guys have heard you know about the prisoners at andersonville that were hanged um mm -hmm. that were put on trial and hanged many of them are from new york are from the city so there's a judgment of like new yorkers are uh more um rough are less genteel, are like, yeah, city dwellers, right? Right. Um, that they're criminals. You'll, so you'll see that distinction between either like rural versus urban. Mm -hmm. You have distinctions between, yes, people from who are made from like border states who are in smaller units. Um, like, so you have like Missouri troops, Kentucky troops, what have you, um, and how they are perceived by maybe troops from Maine or like Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, you'll have elite groups, like there are elite units. So um, like the 69th will, you know, they are kind of more insular right. because they're seen as more elite and how people perceive that. Mm. Um you also depends on like where they're held and how that differs. So after the war, I know you're talking like more about during the war, but even afterwards you have people differ about which camps were worse. So you would think that um, prisoners of war would maybe bind like group together as prisoners of war, but we even see the distinctions and differences in how they portray themselves and how they discuss themselves in their narratives and how they portray themselves to the wider American public. Mm -hmm. So, You'll have people from Cahaba, which is in Alabama, or Andersonville, argue that they had it worse than other people in other Southern prisoner, prison mm -hmm. camps. So they had it much worse than the people who maybe were later at Salisbury, mm -hmm. right? Um, or, again, Gary mentioned, like, brought up Camp Douglas. So you'll have people who were held in Camp Douglas saying that they um, had it worse than Elmira and vice versa. Right. Right? Right. Um, you actually usually have prisoner of war memorial groups, but sometimes you'll have the Andersonville like veterans association. I was just going to ask that. Did they come up with like their own club or yeah, organization? They, they had their own or club. They had, yep. They had their own boards. They had their own mm -hmm. sayings. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it's kind of, you're not surprised again, right? You have people who you were at Tetum today. So mm -hmm. you have veterans who then go to the Antietam reunion, right? Right. So they're like, oh, you were at Antietam? I was at Antietam. Now we understand each other because we experienced a similar battle. Mm -hmm. So we have that connection. So it's mm -hmm. not surprising that you're seeing people, oh, I was at Andersonville and you were at Andersonville? Right. Or you were at Point Lookout, I was at Point Lookout, <laughs> and have that connection. But then they would also compete against each other. You also see this change over time. Uh, by the turn of the century, even in like, so 1900, to like 1930, you see these soften, especially even between groups, the like Confederate and Union, you see more respect. Well, we all served, we all suffered. Mm -hmm. And you see a little bit more of that softening of those divisions mm -hmm. and more overall recognition. But especially as Union POWs are pushing for pensions um, before the 1890 more open pension law, that you have a competition of who had it worse and who deserves money from the government. And right. who deserves more sympathy? Doesn't that go back to uh, the idea of masculinity again, where it's just like I, I was captured or whatever, and that drops me down a tier in some people's eyes. But I had it so much worse in Andersonville than you did at Elmira, or you did at Camp Douglas, or the guy from Camp Douglas says the same thing to the guy from Andersonville. 
it's is it kind of this they're they're gone for the position basically the position play saying hey i might have been captured but i had it i had a hell of a time in camp douglas or yeah, whatever there was so alexander stevens right mm -hmm. um the vice president of the confederacy he published a memoir and he was held as a political prisoner mm -hmm. after the war and so he wrote a memoir about his experiences and the big I think takeaway quote from his memoir is we had it as bad as any prisoner of war in a Confederate prison camp. He's saying that, and again, he was only there for a couple of weeks and he was right. in the nice digs. Um, yeah, yeah. But they're saying that though Confederate prisoner of war held in union camps had it as bad as any, if not worse mm -hmm. than those held in Confederate prisoner of war camps. Mm -hmm. So camp Douglas, um, Andersonville of the North. Right. 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 Um, which, again, these camps are incredibly deadly. Right. Like mm -hmm. we have 13 percent of prisoner of war dying in one camp, 12.5 dying in another camp. And they will argue over that point five, um, <laughs> yeah. which one's more deadly or they'll argue over. So in Andersonville or in like more southern prisoner of war camps is the heat. Right. The heat. That's mm -hmm. the rough part or, you know, the starving to death. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also then you have in Elmira pointing out the cold. Well, what's worse? Right. We were cold. The guards took away our furnaces. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, or you'll have the time, the length, that will be a comparison. So what they were trying to push for was that if you, I think they then they finally passed is six months or more in a prisoner of war camp, you were able, you were up for a pension. Okay. Right? Right. Um, six, more, six months or more. And you mm -hmm. had to have uh, two or more people testify to the fact that your disability is related to your prisoner experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then people will be like, well, I was six months in Andersonville. And somebody will be like, well, I was nine months in this place. Or um, again, you talk to Angie and I know you talked to Lorian foot um, about how they start pulling people out of Andersonville, right? As the right. union army starts pushing in and they start transferring them to various camps. So you'll have people, well, I was pulled out of Andersonville and sent to, you know, Millen, for like two weeks, but then we were up at Salisbury for two weeks and like you only were ever in Andersonville. You don't know what it's like. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. And they'll start comparing those stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's definitely some differences and they highlight those. Mm -hmm. The, I think one of the best stories that I'll quick bring up is, and I think best, uh, maybe is not the correct term there, um, but I get way too overly excited about my research. <laughs> um, but one, I want to say depressing, but yet fascinating stories mm -hmm. is about the Sultana disaster. Have you ever heard of the Sultana oh, yeah. disaster? Yeah. yeah, I don't know if anybody in the comments has, but I definitely have, yes. So, like People in the comments, raise your hand if you've heard of the Sultana disaster. Yes, we both can see your comments, so go right ahead. <laughs> um, raise your hands. I want to hear about it. Um, so the Sultana... Um, is the greatest maritime disaster in American history. Uh, more people died. Michelle, yes. Yes, Michelle's um, the first one. <laughs> more people died um, in the Sultana disaster than the Titanic, right? right? Everyone knows about the Titanic, but we don't have a Leonardo DiCaprio for the Sultana. <laughs> Not yet. We should, we Not should, yet. we should yeah. push that on Twitter. That's he's our getting, He's getting older and rougher looking. He's looking, he could look like a Union POW after a while. We could do that. <laughs> um, so the Sultana was a steamboat that was loaded down with recently released prisoners from Cahaba and Andersonville, right? And they're they're finally being released. It's after the war and they're heading up the Mississippi um, to hospitals to return home. Many are very, very weak after weeks, months in prison. Um, and some of these individuals are even the ones that were kind of like left behind and unable to make it to trains and unable to make it to other ways of being um, removed from the South after the war. Mm -hmm. So they overload this steamboat. Um, and of course it blows a boiler, um, horrific explosion on the Mississippi um, and hundreds die. Mm -hmm. um, some drown one because they can't swim two because they're too weak or they're burned so badly that they can't swim. Some people are killed instantly in the explosion. Some people die of burns. It's horrific. Mm -hmm. yep. In 1890, in the late 1880s, and then the book is published in 1890, one of the veterans, one of the survivors of the Sultana starts to do a letter writing campaign um, and like letters to the editor to newspapers asking if there's any other survivors of the Sultana and if they'll come forward and share their stories. Hmm. 
because he's realized that they've been largely forgotten. Um, what's most depressing about this story is it's when the news hits about the Sultana, it's the same time that news is hitting that pr President Lincoln is assassinated. Oh, so wow. it's quickly forgotten. Right. Um, it doesn't get front page news. It's those individuals are just right. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very small Sultana memorial in Tennessee for it. And then there's another smaller one in the cemetery. But again, it's kind of lost to history. So they they feel like they've also been lost to history and they're writing for people to come forward and share their stories. And these individuals, and this is my argument, it's more like kind of my epilogue, but I've also presented on it, is that these individuals don't identify as Cahaba survivors. They don't identify as Anderson survivors. They identify as Sultana survivors. That experience mm -hmm. is so significant and so important and central to their identity as veterans and as POWs. Mm -hmm. So you have a few people mention about how they were captured and their time in prisoner of war camp, but everyone's focus, everyone who writes in focuses on that explosion and their experience during that explosion. And then after the war hmm. and there are no, they don't have a reunion, right? There's, hmm. they, you know, apply for pensions and then how some of them will say like, yeah, well I was weakened. I had dysentery from this time, but really why I'm truly applying is because I got third degree burns <laughs> at the Sultana. Yeah. Um, these some people who they, and we, again, we see this with some veterans. We know that some veterans escape, look at Gettysburg. Um, I think it's what South Dakota, uh, that they escape mm -hmm. and they all set up their own town. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gettysburg, South Dakota. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, but some of the people escape because they feel like they have no community identity and no relationships that they just leave. Um, several from the Sultan disaster show up in Mi Missouri, actually, um, mm -hmm. kind of hoping the West will give them a new start and new options. And one of the saddest entries, it's only about a, two paragraphs long And the last line is, and I'm not doing much of anything now, hmm. period. Wow. And it's like the saddest, you realize that this is probably the first time he's written in and talked mm -hmm. to someone who might understand what he's gone through. So they identify as Sultana and not as anything else. Wow. Which is fascinating. Yeah. And it's one of those things that is largely forgotten. So I I'm wonder. glad every single person who says <laughs> yes that they know what this is. Yeah, I wonder, I'm so happy. I wonder if that's because Angela, that's like the last big traumatic event they experienced, according to what we consider the war. Mm -hmm. uh, that that was the one where it was like we survived Andersonville or or wherever, and this this though was we survived all that, and we even survived. The Sultana. You're uh, exactly right, John. You were exactly right. They're like, we survived. We went through all of this. We survived battle. We survived capture. We survived these horrific prisoner of war mm -hmm. experiences. And then we also survived this. And this is our the pinnacle of our experience. Right. It's kind of like the high water mark of our service, so to speak, where it's like, yeah, this we survived everything you threw at us, including a disaster, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, um, and then, because then nothing compares, right? So if you're talking to another survivor, um, so like, look at like, was it Camp Ford in, Ta in Texas, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of, again, another kind of forgotten prisoner of war camp. They had a newspaper. I have pictures of this awesome new paper. It's fantastic. But wow. it, their experiences will never compare to those who are at Camp Ford. Camp Ford to them will be like a, you know, walk in the park. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So they might respect those. I'm sure they, they respect those other individuals, but their experiences will never compare. Their trauma mm -hmm. will never compare. It will always, to them, be more horrific mm -hmm. and maybe worthy of more remembrance than someone who was just even just, you know, in a open field prison for a few weeks before they were exchanged. Yeah. Then prisoners of war doesn't compare. Yeah. It's kind of like, uh comparative ways it's kind of like uh the men who were on the indianapolis in the second world war they remember that's that's the big thing for them and when you i met a few of them uh before most of them i think all of them have gone or most of them are gone and it was like wow you were on the indianapolis that's crazy you know and it, and we have movies about it and such but i can only imagine what people in the post-war America were like, wow, you were on the Sultana. That, especially if you live along Mississippi, you knew what the Sultana was. Mm -hmm. um, because you had heard it up and down the newspapers in the Mississippi River. And uh, yeah. that had to be a similar kind of thing 
uh, and for they published, that. So. They published photos of it. So they took a photo. Um, I believe it's when they're actually leaving Natchez, one of their final stops yeah. before it exploded. Mm -hmm. um, they took a photograph of the, how the steamboat and how overloaded it was. And you can just see people pressed up against the railings. So that photo then circulated in newspapers, but again, quickly overshadowed by right. the Lincoln assassination. Right. Um, there was even this huge um, investigation, um, even in the newspapers about why it exploded, what happened mm -hmm. to it. And they're like, well, it was a Confederate mine. It was a torpedo. It was, you know, a spy. Like there's, it's one last ditch effort for the South to, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to say rise again, but come back. I don't know. Right, um, right. Say whatever you want, Angela. That's fine. <laughs> it's whatever. Well, whatever. Like whatever. our current situation, but, our political but, situation. Not, let's not bring up those terms. Right. But, but yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Because think about it. The president had just been shot and, and they don't, and Seward had been stabbed. Everything else had been going on. They don't know what's exactly happening. There's obviously going to be conspiracy theories at that time, as far as all, like you said, Oh, here's another effort now in the West to start causing havoc. Maybe they're connected, et cetera, et cetera. And people must've been just crazy mad. Horrified. What might happen? Yeah. Well, it's, it's fascinating because um, I see a few people mentioning, like, did people forgive each other or what have you? And you actually see, so the book that I'm mentioning is um, published in 1890 for mm -hmm. the, the Sultana survivors. And you actually see a few stories claiming that a Confederate veteran had saved dozens of people. And they're like, we never know his name. We don't know who it was. But a Confederate veteran um, came out in his canoe, in his little boat, and were saving Union prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't, don't know if that story is true, but it is a story that makes it through multiple narratives in this publication and then throughout mm -hmm. newspapers saying that there's someone from the other side who risked his own life to enter the burning water to save the former enemy. Mm, wow. Right. So what does that tell us? Right. Cause if it's not true, that's a great story about reconciliation. If it is true, how true is it? Again, they still included it. So either way it points us towards reconciliation, mm -hmm. whether it's true or it's not true. It serves a purpose. Right. Right. I, I want to draw attention to uh, Tyler Tierney's uh, question, which is, uh, were POWs given an increased pension from the government? Uh, oh, there was there was going to be a war dog uh, showing here as Sorry, well. Sorry, guys. I, um, <laughs> I actually like, made sure that they were locked in here mostly because they don't bark. But this is Rocky. Hi, Rocky. He is my 12-year-old rescue. Nice. Korean mix. He nice. um joke that he's like a World War II vet. Like he's just like deaf and just <laughs> kind of angry at the world. Like you're making me walk. I storm the beaches. What are you doing? Yeah. And yeah. then um the other dog is asleep on the bed. Nice. So I won't wake him up. Um, but what was the you said the question about the increased pensions? Yeah, where POW is given an increased pension from the government. And this leads to another question for me after you're finished with this one. So it's not a blanket. It's not, it's so by case by case. So again, like pensions, they had to apply um, and they had to kind of explain, they definitely had to explain their disability, where their disability came from. So they had to prove that it was from their imprisonment experience. Okay. Um, eventually a pension law is passed for union veterans across the board to get pensions for their service. Um, as you guys, like you just saw that the old, the person who was getting the pension from the Civil War veteran, her dad right. has passed away. So eventually they do pass that blanket law. But initially you had to prove yourself. And then you also had to prove that it came from your captivity, which is incredibly difficult to do. Because um, many of these people that are still debilitated by their captivity experience, they don't have something very visible. Right. So there's not like they're missing an arm or they're missing a leg. Um, we don't see the amputees like Brian Craig Miller talks about in his book. That's a very visible wound. Um, if anything, it's very invisible and they might get bouts. So like dysentery and malaria can actually resurface after a time when your immune system kind of breaks down from another illness. You can have a resurfacing or a, um, a flare. So they would have to say that. And they, how do you prove that? Right. Because right. other people have dysentery. People cross. Um, service has dysentery. Um, you you know have to have a doctor's note. You maybe need it um, more than one doctor's note. You also need it testimony from family and friends or former comrades to also say that they were with you in prison or they knew that your 
debilitation was from prison. So it was incredibly difficult early on to secure a pension because you were a prisoner of war. Mm-hmm. And you also understand that some people, um, I don't know, Adam Dombey's, you know, most recent book, The False Cause, he's talking right. about fraud in pension files. Um, he's looking at more the Confederate side um, about people applying, saying that they're always loyal to the union and they're unionists. But fraud is also um, a big part of this. And they're afraid that people are being unworthy and that they're just claiming disabilities that they don't have. Because, again, they're invisible. Mm-hmm. How do you prove an invisible disability? Mm-hmm. Um, Sarah Hanley Cousins just wrote about this in her book about, um, was it Bodies in Blue? Yes, um, I think so, yeah. But again, like, how do you prove this invisible mm-hmm. disability? Mm-hmm. And I like the kind of joke is like, once you have a bout of dysentery, do you call the doctor and like the pensioner to come to your house? You're like, no, look, seriously, I'm sick. But again, how do you prove that that's from your prisoner of war experience? Right, right. And I've, I've seen this time and again with my friends who are uh, OIF veterans. Uh, they'll say it's it's the uh, getting disability is almost fraudulent sometimes because they're like every anybody can get it. They're like you just say you've had head trauma and and they they actually there's blowback with some of my friends who are in OIF to men and women who get disability who they think aren't worthy of the disability claims. And so you're getting this friction. Uh, against it. So I can only imagine what it could have been like back then with some of them were like, well, I had it harder than you or because now I hear, oh, I've had more concussions than you. That's what I hear now more than yeah. anything else. And and uh, which is kind of a fun topic to talk about when you're with your coworkers in the archives and you're going around the room and you're like, wow, between all of us, we have 20 concussions. This is fantastic. Uh, and there's only like five of you. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, but, but yeah, it's still, we're still debating it today. And it's almost like, instead of what camps were you at, it's now how much, uh, how many concussions have you had traumatic brain injury possibility, stuff like that. And like, Oh, you've only had two. Oh, that's nothing. Well and also, so children. at the time, right. They don't understand as much about psychological disorders as we do now, right? So mm-hmm. even the American Journal of Psychiatry was used to be the American Journal of Insanity, right? Um, right? They don't really understand it. They also think that alcoholism is a is a case within itself instead of being a symptom of insanity or a symptom of um, mental trauma or mm-hmm. a way of um, self-helping, self-treating. They right. think that it's a disorder to itself. So. Mm-hmm. We, of course, know that that's not the case, mm-hmm. but they would, if you were an alcoholic because of your traumatic experience and that's the way you're trying to cope, mm-hmm. they believe that that's like you, you were, um, what would be the word? Um, a degenerate, right? They didn't see you as right. someone who was disabled and required help. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So that was hidden. You had to hide yourself for being alcoholic or, um, you know, Jonathan Jones just wrote a great piece in, I think, JCWE about opiate abuse, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Again, opiate abuse, we know that veterans, Civil War veterans, um, POWs would treat themselves, self-treat with opium to help with their pain that they have left over, especially in their joints. Um, Mm -hmm. Many people like their joints just never recovered um, from a from issues that they developed during prison of war. So they would treat with opiates. Well, again, opiate abuse is seen um, as like a mark of dishonor, a mark of being unmanly as weakness rather right. than you're trying to cope and treat yourself for a problem. Right. Yeah. That's, that's exactly like, uh, Andrea brought up again, uh, did claiming disability do something to one's manhood? Uh, I guess she means in similar ways to claiming to surrender. Um, I, I think that even goes in my opinion, I think that even goes to today with some people. They see it as lesser than them. Oh, I'll get over it, or you're weak for wanting it, or something like that. And I'm thinking, I'm wondering too if you've seen this in 19th century personalities with with manhood. Oh, definitely. So the idea of being a dependent is a very feminine characteristic, right? Mm-hmm. Or for children. Mm-hmm. So the idea that you are dependent on someone to take care of you, especially the federal government, is considered a weakness. Is considered um, unmanly. Mm-hmm. So their um, prisoners of war veterans overall have to kind of reconcile with their identities, that they are still worthy of remembrance 
And actually they try to twist it, not even twist it, to kind of bend it to say that they are worthy of recompense, that they served and now this is their payment for that. Mm -hmm. um, that they're not dependents, but that they're worthy in other ways. Mm -hmm. But they really have to reconcile with their identity as men and their identity as veterans. Because a POW, like we already talked about capture and surrender, is not um, kind of the ideal situation, right? It kind of goes against societal expectations of what a veteran is and what a veteran should be. Mm -hmm. So they also have to struggle with that. So not only maybe they're not, they're considered not as worthy as other veterans, but then they're not worthy of pensions because they're dependents and they're re they require help. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that before we uh, wrap up, I do want to ask about that last pensioner who who just passed away, the last Civil War pensioner. Um, her, I guess it was her father. Her uh, dad, uh, yeah. Her dad was a, yeah, was a Confederate soldier originally, became a prisoner of war and galvanized and became a federal yep. soldier. How, have you run into any accounts like that in your research where men have switched sides once they are captured? Yes, I have. Um, galvanized Yankees. Have yeah. You? Yeah. Um, yeah. This actually does come up and it's interesting how they, how they um, consider themselves and how other people consider them. Mm -hmm. So people who didn't galvanize, who didn't switch sides, they often earlier on in earlier narratives, I would say even into the late 1880s, turn of the century, consider these people traitors, mm -hmm. right? That they're disloyal, that they were never truly loyal, that they're there just to make money. Um, they're out for their own skin. Um, you seem kind of see a change over time where they become more considerate towards these individuals, maybe more forgiving, saying like, yes, it was really rough. Um, not everyone is as strong as I am. They usually kind of as use a juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. um, but they're more forgiving. They're more understanding. Hmm. Um, that does change over time. Some people obviously never <laughs> even, you know, some people don't forgive them. Right. But some people say that they did what they had to. The idea of like, you didn't have to escape. You didn't have to actively resist. The idea of just like waking up every day was enough of a resistance. And you didn't, even if you switch sides, there had to be another reason for it. You weren't completely disloyal. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Um, those who did galvanize, they also say that there's reasons for it, right? That they were very hungry, that they, they knew that they were going to die if they didn't get out. Um, that maybe they were conscripted. Right, that they were conscripted into the Confederate Army and they were forced to fight in the Confederate Army, and they were never really loyal to the Confederacy anyway. I was wondering, which, yeah. which is something you'll see quite often. Um, mm -hmm. They'll explain that they were, you know, Ken No's famous book, Reluctant Rebels, that they were reluctant rebel, right. and that once they were captured, they took that as an opportunity to serve mm -hmm. in the Union Army. Mm -hmm. And again, many of these people. They weren't forced to go on the same field and fight their former comrades. That many of them are sent out west, right, to fight in Western conflicts with Native Americans. So you don't have these guys then showing up on like the fields of Atlanta. You have them out in Missouri and Kansas and those territories. Mm -hmm. I guess what a lot of people don't realize is that they're not going out and fighting against their old comrades. They're being shipped to a different theater. Which is one is one part is you know. You, you, if they are possibly loyal mm -hmm. to their Confederacy still, um, which some did once they got in, they, they, they joined the Union Army, they signed up, and then guess what? They escaped and then went back to Confederate lines. That does happen. I'm not saying it doesn't. Right. Um, they use this as a way to escape prison and then kind of opening the door. Yeah. Um, and they deserted. The, if that is a chance, they're not going to send those guys to, you know, 20 yards from their previous line, right? right. So right. they are sending them out west. Right. Um, to keep them from then skedaddling back to their lines. Right. But that's a fascinating story. I just like that story of this woman and her dad, like 78, marrying like a 28 year old and like, yeah. well done, sir. Right. Like, well done. <laughs> yeah. Good but, on you. Yeah. <laughs> this is a crazy story. Crazy. Right. Yeah. Um, and how she was still collecting like $73 yeah. a month. Because yep. her father served for a few weeks in the Union Army. Like, that blows my mind. Mm -hmm. And for anyone interested, like, there's a huge scholarship, historiographical discussion about how the Civil War um, initiates kind of our welfare system and how, you know, we expand the pension system. Starts with 
the Civil War. And of course it grows with World War One and um, World War II significantly, but right. there's a substantial number of books that talk about how it starts in the Civil War, taking care of um, like the invalids, like the invalid corps, the disabled veterans, but also their widows and orphans. So if anyone's interested in that, there's multiple books and I'm sure we can list them out in the chat afterwards. Sure. Yeah. I know there's going to be a lot of, a lot of people uh, in the chat afterwards uh, who will have to, to answer and stuff. Um, but Angela, what is one takeaway from this for our, for our, our viewing uh, friends here? If they want to, you know, really dive into something like this post-war memory of prisoners of war, uh, post-war memory of the war in general, what kind of, uh, advice would you give to someone looking in that direction? Um, I think to just use some of the tools that are free at our fingertips. Um, so like I mentioned, archive.org, mm -hmm. I think is a great option. If you go, it's free, right? Um, so mm -hmm. this is a way, especially when you're at home and social distancing and being safe and healthy and washing your hands is that you can explore this. You can go and look at books that are in archives throughout the country also in the National Archives, and they're available online. And you can, of course, just um, type in Prisoners of War, Civil War, Andersonville, and a ton of options will pop up. I also, and then just read, just enjoy the stories. Some of the stories are, like I said, fantastic adventure stories. Um, so they're even just enjoyable to read. And then you can really start to think about, well, what are they trying to tell us? What are they constructing here? So something you'll come up, I, I of course had Rocky on my lap a second ago, but something that comes up a lot um, are dogs, actually. I see people talking about their dogs and how prisoners will talk about dogs, whether it become um, their buddies in camp, whether they eat them because they're starving and they, you know, mm, we'll ate a dog. <laughs> uh, or you have about people who are escaping and they're tracked down by bloodhounds, which of course we know if we look at the records, the number, like they don't have bloodhounds on staff. They're usually just like mutt farm dogs, but everyone can picture what a bloodhound looks like. So right. it's a perfect tool to get your audience members to come up with an image in their head, right? Mm -hmm. um, or they would say Henry Wirtz looked like a, a terrier, which I looked him up. He doesn't look like, he, if anything, he looks like a badger. Like, but, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, you're like, not a terrier. Yeah, not a terrier. Um, mm -hmm. Terriers are adorable. Yes. So I would, you know, just just dive in to the stories. Um, something that just popped up if you guys, um, you know, Ancestry.com, but also Fold3.com is paired with Ancestry. And you can track down veterans from across American history. Mm -hmm. um, that's also linked with like the National Archives and other archives and the um, service records. So um, you can get a lot of it via like free, like uh, even a free trial, but sometimes you have to pay like this, this month they're doing a special that's like $30 off. This is not sponsored, but I really love these sites. <laughs> yeah. um, so if you guys just want to dig in to archives without actually having to go to the archives or travel, you can do it just like on your couch or in your desk with your docs. Right. And now so, like, we have to do that, right? And they're not open. So yeah, Andrea, yes. A honey badger. Definitely. Henry yeah. Wirtz does not care. Henry Wirtz was a honey badger. Yeah. He was a honey badger. <laughs> That's going to be the uh, the next uh, book. Henry uh, Henry Wirtz was a honey badger. Dumb. Uh, Dumb. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we'll we'll definitely uh, Andrea posted again. Uh, can you please post those links? We will I do will. that in the in the comments section for you. Um, it's been great to have you on, Angela. It's been fantastic. Oh. Thank you. And and please come back when you want to talk more because, you know, there's so much more that needs to be going over with this topic as we go forward. And um, I think with James and I on the field today doing comparative history between basically grandfathers and grandsons, it's kind of cool to try to connect this with different POW experiences in the past. And it'd be great to do a POW panel on here sometime. I think that'd be awesome. Oh yeah, definitely. I think you and James did a great job talking about how language changes over time. We can do memory changes over time and how it also changes between different POWs from different wars. It would be fantastic. Yeah. I would really enjoy doing that because I really think these guys uh, in the, in the civil war field have been overlooked for a very long time. We're starting to see great though books and monographs come out on these 
situations uh, with like uh, Angie Zombeck and with uh, Evan Kutzler and, and others who are doing some great stuff and, and you obviously doing, doing great work and a lot of other people doing great work. It's awesome to see these men get their due in the civil war, uh, I guess in, in the monographs and in articles and all that stuff, because they're far too often overlooked. And I've often wondered if it was because of uh, masculinity issues involved with capture um, mm -hmm. because we see this over and over again. We hear about it in the uh, Bushido code and the Japanese and uh, because it's, it's lesser, you're a lesser yep. person. And I've often wondered that with 19th century thought um, and how that went in, but I'm so glad that you were able to come on and, talk to us and, and give us a shot of, of one of your pups. And yeah, Duke got... is, here, here, let me get Duke really quick and you can see Oh, him. you don't have to wake him. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. Come here. You're the one that has to put up with that afterwards. So go oh, my God. <laughs> so, there you go. Oh, yeah. This is, everyone, this is Duke. He is my pride and joy. Oh, my. He is, um, so I joke that he was actually my dissertation dog. So I got him while finishing PhD comps because he was a comps puppy. Nice. And then he became a dissertation dog. Awesome. So he is, so he's part terrier. He doesn't, he's adorable. Yeah, he doesn't look like Henry Wirtz. No, Henry Wirtz. He is not <laughs> a commandant of Andersonville. He's adorable. No. no. This is fantastic. Yes, John. Thank you so much. Oh, and you're very welcome. Putting up with my overexcitement and my dogs. No, that, that's what we need more of on here. I'm, I'm, I want to have people excited and happy and, and being able to showcase the research. And I'm so glad you had the time to come on and do just that. Yeah, thank you so much. You're very welcome. And thank you, everyone, for all the awesome comments, questions. We're definitely going to have to go back through it over the next day or so and uh, see what you all have to say that we didn't get to. I apologize for that, but I definitely wanted to get a lot of you on here because it's very important that you feel a part of this process. And uh, so I appreciate that. And once again, Angela, I really appreciate you coming on here and being a part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Take care of yourselves.